Hello, good afternoon. Hope you had a nice lunch. <laughs> um, my name is Professor Randall Chestnut, and uh, I'm a neurosurgeon and uh, an intensivist here at Harborview Medical Center, uh, where I uh, direct the neurotrauma service. Uh, I'm going to speak to you today about uh, traumatic brain injury, uh, acute care, and I'm going to try to speak about what really helps brain injury patients. Uh, this may upset some people who are fan who are fans of certain fancy monitoring devices and or who think all care occurs in the ICU because I think as we'll find uh, a lot of the uh, most critical interventions etc are outside of the ICU and are not dependent on uh, new fancy sexy instrumentation uh, I want to start off a little bit with the background because I think there's been some important developments that have been misinterpreted. In the 50s and 60s, there were only two types of traumatic brain injury. There was essentially surgical traumatic brain injury, which had a clot that could be surgically evacuated, and not surgical traumatic brain injury, which wasn't amenable to surgical treatment. Other than that, um, other than surgery, all patients were mostly treated by observation uh, and support. Uh, indeed, even the surgical ones after surgery fell into the non-surgical patient. However, after the advent of intracranial pressure monitoring, things changed. Suddenly, all patients became treatable. Uh, you could monitor surgical patients and non-surgical patients. You could follow their intracranial pressures. You admitted them to the ICU for such treatment, and it radically changed traumatic brain injury. It changed it from an anatomic disease, a surgical disease, to a physiologic disease, which afforded treatment to all and much more treatment. And so during that time, we thought a lot about intracranial pressure, and it was over the 70s and 80s that a lot of our critical concepts came up. Compliance, cerebral perfusion pressure, waveform analysis, et cetera. Very exciting time in intracranial pressure. However, as all things, that excitement began to wane or get redirected. The focus really changed from understanding intracranial pressure to simply managing it, how to make ICP go down. And there were a lot of different schools of treatment that came up who all argued that their treatment was the best. And, and that was kind of the storm and drong of the time. We accepted an ICP treatment threshold of 20 millimeters of mercury, even without a lot of supportive evidence. ICP became essentially a done deal. We now knew how to take care of it, and we moved on to new and sexy monitors. So again, the, the magpie effect. We basically made ICP way too simple. 21 was bad, 19 was good, sort of what's next. But tra traumatic brain injury isn't really that simple. Uh, intracranial pressure is not brain injury. It can be easily thought of as brain injury, but it's not. Now, the argument that ICP was so important came because there was a large change in mortality about the time that ICP showed up. Uh, but there's a fallacy to this argument because it really only looks at the correlation between ICP and outcome. When you put an ICP monitor in someone's head, first of all, as we said before, the whole paradigm changes. Now all patients are treatable. Second, you can use critical care management of intracranial pressure to help manage the injured brain. However, putting someone in the ICU also gives them much better general care. Intensivist involvement, ICU nursing, control of infectious disease, ventilator management, etc. So a lot of potentially beneficial things happen when you put an ICP monitor in someone's head. And at about the same time as we really started doing that, at least at sort of the more traumatic brain injury centers, a lot of other areas that are relevant to brain injury also had significant advances. Probably the biggest advance ever to occur in traumatic brain injury was imaging. Suddenly we had CT scanning readily available to we could finally see what we were doing. So although the correlation we, we quoted was about ICP monitoring and outcome, in truth, it should be the entire concatenation of these, these different items. And, and so this cartoon should actually look like this cartoon. And we should recognize that differentiating the contribution of any one agent to this change requires a randomized control trial where we control for the other confounding variables. Well, in 2012, we published one of those where we looked at a group that had ICP monitor-based treatment against a group that did not have ICP monitor-based treatment. And what this was, and it's important to recognize this, this was not a trial of ICP monitoring. This was a trial of ways of using it. We tested two protocols. The generally accepted protocol for treating intracranial hypertension, elevated ICP, and a group of patients, uh, randomized patients, who 
did not have ICP monitoring and were treated aggressively with imaging based on imaging and clinical examination, but they didn't have a monitor put in their head. And the sort of long story short, both our primary uh, pre-specified and our secondary outcomes were the same in both groups, undifferentiable. It wasn't that there was no difference. Uh, ICP monitored patients were more efficiently treated, fewer total treatments and fewer ICU days. But the overall finding was that there wasn't a significant difference in outcome. And so the question became, how did this fancy monitor to which we attributed so much influence not show a major improvement in outcome? What, what is it that we did at the time that we saw that outcome drop, that outcome improvement? What is responsible for that, since it doesn't appear to be solely ICP monitoring? Well, if you look at the pathophysiology underlying brain injury, which has mostly be de been delineated in uh, laboratory studies, and you look at the treatments we administer to control ICP, you can see there's almost no relationship. The treatments we give just bring the ICP down. They don't change the fundamental physiology. Essentially, we treat the symptoms while the brain heals itself. Now, that is actually a very valid thing to do since we don't really understand all the pathophysiology because what we're doing is we're avoiding secondary insults, which are really strongly determinant of outcome. So it's not like we're wasting our time, but we're not really treating brain injury. We're treating sort of an epiphenomenon. So what are we treating? What, what, what really are these secondary insults that can make a profound impact on outcome? Well, probably the most profound one is represented here where we looked at hypotension. Now this was a very brief episode of hypotension. One measurement of a systolic blood pressure less than 90 up to and into hospital resuscitation. So sort of from scene to the end of resuscitation. What we found was one of those episodes was associated with a doubling of mortality and occurred in about a third of patients. So a frequent and profoundly influential secondary insult. We looked further at that by starting to look at uh, patients who survived in ICU and pre-hospital outcome was strongly influential of, pre-hospital hypotension was strongly influential of outcome. But interestingly enough, we weren't really safe once we got to hospital because hypotension still occurred once in a while in the ICU during resuscitation resuscitation, and it was also strongly associated with poor outcome. And when we did aggression analysis, we found that these were statistically independent. So we had two independent predictors of outcome, both of which were associated with low blood pressure. So this is really probably the most profound determinant of outcome that we can manage early in the patient's course. Perfuse it or lose it is the mantra. And actually, until the time of that study, the standard approach was was to dehydrate patients, under-resuscitate them, because it was felt that administered fluid made the brain swell, which was obviously not only wrong, but harmful. Time is brain. So the earlier we recognize these problems and treat them, the better the patient arrives, the more we can do with them in hospital. It's important not to miss a brain injury, therefore, and, and to recognize that the patient who may have a pneumothorax and a fractured pelvis and a broken femur also may have a traumatic brain injury. So how do we monitor the traumatic brain injury? Well, essentially the neurologic exam is the best monitor. It's the most sensitive, it's non-invasive, it's easily repeated and it's free. But what we tend to do is to intubate them, sedate them, and sometimes even relax them, and then replace the neurologic exam with thousand dollars worth of monitor, which are limited in the scope of each monitor. They're often invasive, they may or may not be continuous, and they're expensive. And that's really the problem with modern management is our most sensitive indicator, the exam, is lost. So I think we need to really focus on what we can get out of the exam. And from the very first encounter with a traumatic brain injury, you can do the exam. You can look at, for instance, vital signs, uh, widened blood pressure, uh, raise in the systolic with really no change in the diastolic. So it, instead of 120 over 80, it becomes 160 over 80. And a low heart rate or the Cushing response. And then irregular breathing or apnea is another sign of neurologic deterioration. On the simple physical exam, changing level of consciousness, changes in the pupils, or alterations in motor behavior are also signs of neurologic deterioration and really indicate an emergency. So how do we look at consciousness? Well, the classic way is with the Glasgow Coma Scale score. And this, remember, only measures consciousness. It's not a neurologic exam. 
For instance, it measures the response in the best limb. So you can have three paralyzed limbs, suggesting a, a significant neurologic uh, insult, and one fully functioning limb, and you will only use that fully functioning limb to do the GCS. So you need to supplement this with a neurologic exam. However, this is extremely useful for the individual value and also for trending over time. Now, it looks awfully complicated with the eye score, verbal score, and motor score, and a lot of people try to substitute it with other monitoring, with other monitoring measures like the AVPU. And, and to be honest, this is not a, a complicated thing. It's really pretty straightforward, and it is not well substituted by the AVPU. Let's just look at it. Essentially, it's a four, five, six uh, uh, monitoring scale. I score is four, verbal score is five, and motor score is six. So the lowest you can get is a one on each, and the highest you can get is four, five, and six. So it ranges from three to 15. The I score is pretty straightforward. What's the worst you can do with your eyes is never open them. And the best is to be spontaneous and looking around. In between, you get two points for opening to pan to pain and three points for opening to command. Verbal score is pretty straightforward too. The worst you can do is no, no sounds at all. The best you can do is be fully oriented. So in between you have three steps, which are basically garbled sounds, uh, inappropriate, which is usually just words, and then confused sentences. So noises, words, and confusion. Pretty straightforward really when you think about it. Motor score is a little more complicated because nothing is one and obeying commands is six, which means most snowboarders can't actually score a GCS motor six, but be that as it may. Um, you have a couple of posturing. For, for extensor posturing, you get two. For flexor posturing, you get three. But beyond that, you get withdrawal to a painful stimulus, which just pull, means pulling away from it, and then localizing, which is actually going after the painful stimulus. So if you stimulate, above the eye, say the supraorbital nerve, the hand crosses the chin, or it crosses the midline if you stimulate the other side. And that gives you GCS motor from one to six. You add these up, they're three to 15. So you get a number and then you monitor it over time. Now, interestingly, the exam is so important that if you lose the exam, there's a very funny thing that happens. You'd think that a motor score of one would be worse than two or three, but it's not. One can sometimes be influenced because of drugs and hypothermia or hypoxia, hypotension, whereas actually posturing suggests a structural lesion in the brain. So the mortality from a Glasgow two or three is worse than one. You really want that sensitive exam. And there's sort of a joke that there's only three hospital GCS scores. Three, which is not, not moving, out, not speaking, and not looking around. Seven, somewhere in the middle, or 15, which is intact. And that probably is really because People aren't taking the time to do the sensitive GCS. But the value in this is, is the way we triage patients. Less than eight is severe head injury. Uh, less than 12 is a moderate injury, which can rapidly turn into a severe injury. And we can trend them over time because a deterioration at two points is a, an emergency. So take the time to do the exam and then repeat the exam because that's how we save brains. The other thing we need to look at is the pupils. Normally, when you shine light in the pupils, they both re, uh, uh, respond equally by constriction. If, when you shine light, one doesn't come down so that they're anisocoric, so that they're, they're unequal, or one is sluggish or both are sluggish, that's abnormal. And that's a bad sign. That's suggesting that the brainstem is being compressed. Another emergency sign that needs to be treated em emergently. And so de deterioration of Glasgow score and changes in the pupils suggest something we really need to get on. So what do we do when we get on those? Well, first of all, we need to resuscitate. Above all, we need good perfusion of the brain. The brain can swell simply because it's under resuscitated. We need obviously to oxygenate them because that's part of what the blood does. We need to sedate the patient so that they're not thrashing around and, and increasing their metabolic demands. We can mildly hyperventilate because hyperventilation decreases uh, the amount, total amount of blood in the head, which is part of what is swelling but we only do that mildly, not, not vigorously, as used to be done. And then we can give an osmotic diuretic if the blood pressure is acceptable. It used to be given to all uh, suspected brain injuries, but that causes low blood pressure if you don't have adequate fluids on board. So essentially, you gotta focus really on resuscitation first when these patients deteriorate. You don't treat for herniation 
unless you have evidence of it. If you do have evidence of it, you consider mild hyperventilation and you consider hyperosmotic treatments like mannitol or hypertonic saline if the blood pressure is, is uh, okay. But the important thing also is to appropriately triage them. Sick patients need to go to a head injury center. You may need to stop and go at a smaller center to get them to the head injury center, but the focus needs to be on a place that has a good uh, traumatic brain injury team. And that's really the focus here. At Harborview, I think one of the reasons we do so well with brain injury is not because we have wonderful individuals, but because we recognize that trauma is a team sport. It can't be taken care of by one person. There's no spotlight on any one service, et cetera. It has to be done as a team sport because it involves so many aspects. And that starts right from the beginning, the classic ATLS resuscitation. Everybody in the room has responsibilities and a goal, and they work as a team to, to work the patient out, find all of the critical injuries, and sort of get them packaged within what we consider the golden hour, to do it straightforwardly, efficiently, not miss anything, so that none of this is made up. This is all pre-specified ATLS resuscitation. It sort of becomes a train, though. It kind of becomes, once it's started, it's hard to stop. Everybody has their checklist to check off. And to be honest, with brain injury, once in a while, you need to, to change tracks a little bit maybe knock it off the track, but you don't want to crash the train. But it's important, to remember, it's important to remember that time is brain and that when you're doing the trauma resuscitation, you need to, to take that into consideration. Originally, of course, uh, it wasn't as well integrated into the resuscitation. And so the, the general practice is to obtain a number of imaging studies, et cetera, get the patient packaged and, and all injuries diagnosed. However, when you have really sick patients, what we call type A patients, you need to change that a little bit. So what's a type A patient? What's a patient in which you need to get really stuck into the head? Well, we have a list of them, um, th th and it kind of involves the, the exam and the imaging. So if they have unequal pupils, they're type A. If they have bilateral pupil dilatation, blown pupils, they have a type A. If they've had neurologic deterioration, which is a GCS deterioration of two points or more, so obviously that serial exam is important. And then what the CT shows? Well, if they have a clot in their head, an epidural or subdural, and it's thicker than 10 millimeters, one centimeter, they're type A. They're, they're highly at risk of deteriorating and doing poorly rapidly. If the midline is shifted due to mass effect on one side of the brain, that's a type A. If they have an epidural hematoma and they're less than eight in their Glasgow score, they're type A because those can deteriorate rapidly and need to be managed quickly. And if they're penetrating injury and their Glasgow coma scale score is less than 12, they're also a type A because they need sorting quickly unless they evolve as well. Okay, then beyond, and then if they have a posterior fossa injury, an injury in the back of the head, which is a very constrained space, that's another type A. The point here being is that if you have someone who's either neurologically deteriorating or at high risk of doing so, you need to change things a bit. What we do is we have what's called the cone phone because herniation is also called coning. And it's, a, it's a, an immediate response call to neurosurgery to get down there and help with determining the next steps in the resuscitation. So if the head scan is being done and neurosurgery is standing there and says, this is a surgical lesion or this is a type of patient where you need to get on the head in theater, then the trauma resuscitation protocol is, not the resuscitation protocol, the evaluation protocol, is changed slightly. We have a form of CT scan that, that can be um, uh, done within two minutes. It is a scan from head to toe. Essentially, um, the head's been done, but you get the C-spine, the T-spine, the L-spine, the pelvis, the abdominal compartment, the thoracic compartment, all in one less than two-minute scan. Everything else is reconstructed out of that. And the purpose of that is, is while you're getting theater to open the room, et cetera, you can rapidly finish up the crux of the imaging. And then you may need to change a few things. Like instead of doing more imaging in the belly, if you're really suspicious, you may need to do a peritoneal dialysis in the the operating theater while we're setting up the head. So this is a bit of a change in the trauma train in the resuscitation imaging protocol, and, but it, it adds those precious minutes to the resuscitation of the brain. Because sometimes it's, it's important to get the patient to theater and get the brain surgery started while you're finishing the rest. 
On the other hand, however, first things first, you can't save the brain if the body dies. There are times when you can't rush the patient off to theater for the head. And there are times when you need to rush the patient off the theater for something other than head and you don't understand what's going on in the head. Maybe sometimes you don't even have a CT. What can you do in those instances? Because those are instances for which you need to be prepared. What can you do when direct to theater without a head CT? Well, you can get a portable head CT in theater while they're setting up or immediately after if you have a portable head CT. You can put an ICP monitor in easily during the general surgery procedure uh, or the whatever procedure is ongoing life-saving procedure, and get an idea of the intracranial pressure and monitor it during the case. You can drill diagnostic burr holes. That's an older way of treatment. It isn't done too much, but if you're really concerned that the patient is blowing a pupil and has an epidural hematoma, you can find it and even evacuate it while they're doing the other surgery. And you can also, in conjunction usually with anesthesia, follow the patient's exam, at least the pupils, while they're doing an X-lap or a thoracotomy, et cetera. So it's important not to say, well, they're off in theater with general surgery. There's nothing we can do till they get out and get a CT, because that actually isn't true. Time is brain. And then they end up in the ICU. Well, what do we do in the ICU to continue this, this salvage maneuver, this, this resuscitation? Again, we saw that we thought we understood that the most important thing was merely to have the ICP go down. And that turns out there's more to that than meets the eye. We, we saw the results of the monitored patient versus the non-monitored patient. So what this is telling us is in those cases where you don't have a monitor, aggressive critical care of suspected intracranial hypertension can be very effective. If you do have a monitor, we need to figure out better ways of, of using those numbers. It's not that the numbers are not valuable, but we've kind of been a bit remiss in forwarding the interpretation of those numbers. We need to rethink brain injury management. One protocol for all patients, that's the way essentially it's been done. But the whole idea that if you lower ICP, you've got it right. And so if something doesn't work, you try the next up the scale, et cetera. That's no longer correct. Using one threshold for all injuries, probably different types of injury have different intracranial pressure thresholds. They may change over time after injury. They're probably different in a young patient than an old patient. We can't use one number. And one monitor for all physiology is also a bit ridiculous. There's more to the brain injury than ICP. That's something we need to remember as, all. Remember as well. TBI is not that simple. We have to remember that intracranial hypertension, elevated intracranial pressure, is an epi phenomenon. It's like a fever. You don't know if they have sepsis or pneumonia or necrotizing soft tissue infection, et cetera, and those need to be treated differently. There are many paths to an ICP of 30, and if you're just looking at one monitor, you're not going to realize those. We, we've taken ICP out, and we've made an idol of it, and we've treated it in isolation. It's not even brain injury, it's an epiphenomenon, and it's much more complicated than that because ICP is part of a, of a mosaic that includes a lot of other aspects, metabolism, blood flow, uh, ep electrophysiologic activity, cerebral autoregulation, et cetera. Even ICP isn't monolithic. You can break ICP down into cerebral perfusion, so it's sort of ischemia, and brain swelling, which is herniation. So even a number of 25 has different meanings in different patients for different physiologies. The, this linear processing method that we've been using for 30 years for ICP is patently wrong. And we should be using more of a parallel processing uh, uh, algorithm when we try to recognize the underlying pathophysiologic problems and treat them individually. So the goal is individualized, targeted treatment based on multimodality monitoring. That's really the mantra that's come up in sort of the last five or so years in the recognition that we need the numbers, but we need to use them differently. Rather than just changing the numbers, we need to focus our therapy. What can we target? Well, first is pathologic processes, then there's uh, critical thresholds, then there's trends over time. Pathologic processes, example, are brain swelling and cerebral ischemia. What I was talking about before, about herniation versus ischemia. Now, brain ischemia can cause brain swelling and cause herniation. And increased brain swelling can, can increase the resistance to cerebral 
circulation and cause ischemia. So they're not separable totally, but some patients will have more trouble with cerebral edema, and some people will have more trouble with blood flow problems. And obviously, you may treat the edema by bringing down the brain volume. That isn't gonna help with ischemia. You probably there need to increase carrying capacity and maybe decrease metabolism. So there's a balance there, and that's why it's important not just to treat the ICP, but to treat the underlying physiology. Critical thresholds. Well, intracranial pressure doesn't have an absolute critical threshold. Neither does cerebral perfusion pressure or the patient's hemoglobin, etc. Those can be targeted in each patient over time based on monitors. So we can do much better if we start thinking about physiology than just numbers. And finally, trends over time. Injuries evolve over time, and they evolve in response to treatment. Intracranial processes change, and extracranial processes change. The patient's overall health and iatrogenic um, aspects will evolve. So if a patient develops the respiratory distress syndrome, which really is almost the opposite treatment than brain injury, you need to balance both if you're going to save the patient. Again, save the patient, save the brain. ICP is not a goal. It was once thought of it. It was once thought if you had an ICP of 15, you were happy and things were good, and you had an ICP of 25, then it's bad and you need to lower that number. ICP, however, is not a goal. It's like a tool. It's an alarm clock. When it's up, it tells you something's wrong with the brain, but not what it is. What you need to do at that point is you need to start asking, what is the underlying physiology that's causing the ICP to go up? or disrupting normal brain function. And if you can sort that, you can try to treat it specifically. So again, the mantra is targeted therapy in traumatic brain injury, not just starting one simple linear approach to keeping ICP down and using one specific number to, uh, to target. Now, th there is one problem with multimodality monitoring, and, and that's the idea that he who dies with the most toys wins. That's a bad thing. What we're not doing is just trying to have more monitors than everybody else. Because without a question that you're asking, multimodality monitoring is expensive voyeurism. It's essentially, you can't do it just simply looking at a number. When you put a monitor in, you're supposed to be asking, what's going on? Like, is there cerebral ischemia? And if so, how do I treat it? You're not just looking for a number. If you look for numbers, you, every monitor you put in will increase the amount of treatment that you have to deliver. If you look at physiology, it may skip steps or alter individual steps, and hopefully it will deliver the treatment that's necessary earlier in the algorithm. So that, that's why we want parallel processing instead of linear processing. So you have to remember that he who dies with the most, po nice, most toys still starts with he who dies. And what we need to do is he who lives with the best treatment, that's the win. But let's go back to the basics that we kind of started with in discussing that hold throughout the entirety of traumatic brain injury treatment. What's the most important tool in brain injury? The most important tool is still imaging. Don't medically treat a surgical lesion. Don't misinterpret the response to your treatments without the anatomy. So when something changes, you want to respond to the physiology, but you also need to make sure the anatomy hasn't changed because there's still a very important and strong role of, of surgical treatment in traumatic brain injury. And that's why the combination of neurointensive care and neurosurgical management is still the best approach. What's the most important drug in brain injury? We do billions of dollars of drug research every year, but what's the most important drug? Something that's actually been proven? Well, let's look at what's the most important secondary insult, and that is hypotension, low blood pressure. So what's the most important drug? It is resuscitation fluid. There's a lot of controversy about what the best resuscitation fluid is. If you go to the military experience, which is not really amenable to the civilian situation, but fresh whole blood has amazing influences on resuscitation, amazing. When we start to package blood and store it and separating it out, the plasma from the red cells, et cetera, it isn't so effective and it has hazards. We want, to, we want to keep the carrying capacity up with blood cells, but it's different if it's fresh whole blood and if it's stored blood. And that's why a lot of, a lot of uh, research has been focused on what resuscitation fluid should be. And I think that, that 
the new resuscitate the new some of the new ideas using plasma are probably very good, but there's limited penetration of that. The the studies that have compared um, uh, saline solutions to colloid have not borne out that use of colloid like albumin is beneficial. So realistically, probably the things you should do is is uh, isotonic uh, resuscitation uh, 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 fluids like normal saline, uh, supplemented with blood as necessary to target an initial hematocrit of 21%, or if you have access to it, maybe fresh whole blood or plasma. Um, the one thing to keep in mind though is to use isotonic fluids. The study that we quote here in the background uh, about the influ influence of hypotension outcome changed the resuscitation from restrict fluids to resuscitate but it did not change the necessity of keeping things isotonic. If you add free water, it will in increase swelling, increase brain edema. And lactated ringers is, is hypotonic. It's got a, about 100 cc's of, of free water per liter. So you don't wanna use some of the commonly used resuscitation fluids. Isotonic saline is a better choice, sometimes even hypertonic saline in certain instances. So that's the mantra, but resuscitate and it, the disappointing thing is that despite all of the billions of dollars of research on new drugs, though really the only one that's come up with a positive response has been saline. And then what's the most important monitor? We've got all sorts of toys out there and we can spend a lot of money and drill lots of holes in the head and monitor a lot of things. But the most important monitor is still the clinician and probably the bedside nurse. This is a person who has been at the bedside for a shift of eight to 12 hours has turned the patient, watched the ICP go up and down uh, with stimulus, without stimulus. And when the nurse is involved in rounds, they can describe you a lot of these things to a, to a point of value that can't be equaled by monitors. So I, it's important to remember that what we need is an experienced clinician between the monitor and the patient, not a monitor in between the clinician and the patient. This is a really exciting time in brain injury. What I've, presented to you is some of the basics that we know and understand about resuscitation and early exam, repeated exam recognition of a brain injury, which carry out through the entirety of the inpatient management of brain injury. And then some of the controversies about things we thought were making huge amount of difference that turn out to need reconsideration. Um, so it's an exciting time right now, but it isn't a very settled time. What we thought was true 10 years ago, we realize is incomplete and, and needs to be thought out and amended. So there's a lot of research on multimodality monitoring, how to interpret these numbers, how to put patients into individual treatment categories like you do other diseases, cardiac disease, cancer, et cetera. Treatments focused on certain pathologies. It's a really exciting time. It's a really exciting future. And things will be better in five years than they were 10 years ago by a lot. Um, it's a little unsettled yet, so, but the important thing to remember is that the basics, a good clinical exam followed over time, solid resuscitation, are still and always have been the hallmark of good care. Thank you very much. Okay, so we have a little time for Q&A right now. Let's go ahead and see. It doesn't look like we've got any at just the moment, so let's... Wait a second for people to chime in. Okay. Um, while we're looking, though, can you tell us a little more about your current research, uh, any ongoing projects you have at the moment? Sure. Um, we have a couple of projects. We have a lot of in-house projects on multimodality monitoring and display systems so that we can understand in our own sort of highly developed intensive care unit what these underlying treatment protocols are and how to focus treatment on the, for the individual patient, which appears to make patients better, but also to decrease the number of treatments and the length of stay that they undergo. We also have internationally uh, uh, ongoing funded, NIH funded uh, research in Latin America, following up on the ICP randomized trial um, to look at how to optimize treatment in the absence of fancy monitors because the truth is is that although we are highly resourced in the US and Europe most of the world isn't so by far the vast majority of patients in the world are treated without 
the resources we have. So we're working on treatment algorithms that can improve the care in, in low and middle income areas and maybe per se facto improve the basic care even in high resource countries. And um, what sort of systemic changes and updates would you like to see in TBI care? What comes to mind first when you're thinking of things that you'd like to see change? Well, pre-hospital resuscitation is the biggest one. I mean, and there's a lot of research in that. And since, you know, in the 90s when, when this, it was recognized that we were under-resuscitating traumatic brain injury, that's just a huge change. So I'd have to say there's a lot of good research in pre-hospital resuscitation, recognition, avoidance of bleeding, special protocols for the brain injured patient. Um, again, in Seattle, we are incredibly blessed by unbelievably good pre-hospital care. That is not universal, even in high resource countries, and is absolutely lacking in low and middle income countries where you don't have anything in the way of fancy pre-hospital care. And indeed, a lot of times, most patients don't come to hospital in an ambulance. And if you do come in with an ambulance, it may just be a way of hauling you in there and no pre-hospital treatment. So I would say the better patient arrives at hospital, the better we can do with them at hospital. And we may take credit for it all, but a lot of the time it has to do with the pre-hospital care. So I, the money has to be in, in pre-hospital recognition of brain injury and resuscitation and getting them to the right center. And then at the centers, you start from the bottom up. You start with the, having the right fluids, the right imaging, et cetera, and then you add the fancy monitors on. No, no matter how sexy it is to have the fancy monitors, if you don't do the basics, they don't make a difference. Uh, are there any particular research gaps you see in this project, spots where you think we could use more data that haven't been analyzed yet? Well, there are a lot of demographic gaps. I mean, for instance, the importance of pre-hospital care in most of the world hasn't been well studied. So we don't actually know how many secondary insults these people are getting and the mag their magnitude and if they can be treated. Uh, the other thing is around the world, to, and I'm talking about how to improve brain injury care everywhere, not just at academic centers. Um, most places don't have enough ICU beds. So there's this funny group that we call orphan patients in Spanish, pacientes huerfanos. And, and they, they come to hospital and they should be treated in ICU, but in a very large number of hospitals, there aren't enough beds, so they can't go to ICU. So they receive the best treatment they can get outside of ICU, which is a significant step down from what they would get in ICU. Again, that is a, it's never been described in the literature, uh, yet it's very commonly a current. And understanding that group of patients will give us a lot of information about who needs ICU care, what ICU care, what the difference ICU care means, and how to allocate resources. And that's information that can be used in high resource countries as well as in low, low and middle income countries. In the high income countries, the research that really continues to need to be done is sort of being done now by a group out of Europe, headed by Andrew Maas in, in Antwerp, uh, the center study, and a group in the US with which we're participating, but run by Jeff Manley out of UCSF, the TRAC TBI group, which are large prospective data collection studies. These are not randomized trials, but they're observational trials of thousands of patients. So we'll be able to come up with correlations of treatment variation and outcomes, which will be a large database that will help us improve our targeted care. That needs to be done. And then out of these comparative effectiveness research protocols and analyses, we should come up with very good projects to then study prospectively, even sometimes with randomized trials. So, you know, uh, that of course takes funding organization recognition, which needs to change as well. Um, but but uh, that's the kind of progress we need to make. We need to target specific problems uh, using comparative effectiveness research and then study it prospectively. Um, we've also got a question, what does a non-medical person such as a parent need to know that might help before emergency care if they're present around somebody who's had mild TBI or moderate to severe TBI? Well, the first thing is recognizing it. 
and and when in doubt, sit it out. I mean, that's kind of a sports saying, but in all cases, an unrecognized head injury is a, is a big ha hazard. It can certainly evolve and go from mild to moderate to severe. The other thing is, is the second impact syndrome where having a minor injury and then having another injury within temporal proximity means that you now have one and one equals three or four or five rather than two. So they, they compound in, in a non-linear fashion. So I think the most important thing you can do is to always think in the back of your mind, this person has had something happen, some mischief happen. Is, it, is there a head injury in there? Are they goofy? Are they up there throwing up? Is that a sign of a head injury? If it is, then either evaluate them and follow them if, you, if you're capable of doing that, or get them off to be evaluated by a professional. Don't, don't really wait until they're in trouble. You know, with all due respect, sometimes a CT scan is worth a thousand clinicians. It's just that make sure there's nothing there that needs vigorous, aggressive treatment. I think that's the most important thing. Um, most, uh, I mean, just doing CPR though, uh, ischemia, low blood flow is a traumatic brain injury. It's not traumatic really, but maybe it's dramatic. But you can also help outcome from brain mischief by getting trained in CPR and, and being able to, uh, to administer that because low blood flow from cardiac injury will also cause brain damage and correcting that with CPR um, can help with that. And then there's the other thing that's new and coming and that's stopping the bleeding so that when you see someone who's hemorrhaging, there's the whole stop the bleeding program that started by the American College of Surgeons is now being formally treated because if you bleed out, your brain doesn't have enough flow and you also have a brain injury. So there's a lot of ways to help the brain recovery from insult. Uh, but first of all, you have to recognize the risk. Do you have any particular ongoing um, work that you'd like to share with us that you didn't mention before? Um, well, I think, I, I think probably the most exciting thing that came out of the randomized trial, which was done in low and middle income countries, is that what they were doing worked. Um, and again, you know, if you live in an academic center and research is part of your professional career and you have all the toys you want, you get the idea that all these toys is what makes a difference. And, and, you know, a lot of people who read the literature and not just in other countries, even in rural areas where your, your brain injury is being taken care of by well-trained, excellent surgeons and intensivists, but they don't do head injury every day. They sort of get the idea that if you don't have these fancy devices that are being talked about at the meetings, that you can't do good brain injury care. And I think what we found there was good aggressive medical care, repeated examination, bedside physicians, imaging when necessary can, can have really good outcome. And, and you can't just say, well, I don't have all the toys, therefore I can't help. Um, I think that is a huge message that needs to get around. Well, it looks like we looks like uh, things have slowed down, so we can go ahead and wrap up a few minutes early. Um, thank you very much. All right, thank you.